and week out. And with that in mind, let us go to the Lord in a word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, this morning, let us take to heart those words, and may we trust without borders as well. Father, your spirit takes us to places that we never can imagine. And sometimes it takes us right across the street. But let us be willing to be obedient to your spirit, to wherever it leads us, as we continue to be your disciples here on earth. And we pray in the name of Jesus, amen. Well, good morning, church. At this time, I want to invite you guys to open up your Bibles to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is the fourth book in your New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John chapter 13, we'll read verses 34 and 35. And as you arrive to that place in your Bible, would you stand in reverence to our Lord as we read His Word together this morning? If you do not have a Bible, you can follow on the screens behind me or in front of you. And if you do not have a Bible, we'd love to put a copy of God's Word in your hand. So get with me after service. And we will make sure that before the end of the week, you will have a brand new copy of God's Word in your hand so you can have quiet time alone when you are at home. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, I have the English Standard Translation of the Bible. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That is the word of the Lord, and you may be seated. Well, when Jesus is sharing these words with his disciples, his life is coming to an end. His life here on earth is just hours away, and he knows that in a matter of hours, he's going to be hung, nailed to a cross. For your sins and for mine. But with this in mind, with his pending crucifixion and with his pending departure from the earth, he's giving his disciples last minute instructions. And I know a lot of you guys as parents know exactly what I'm talking about. Because a lot of you guys as parents, as you guys get ready to go out on date night, the babysitter arrives and you've got a laundry list of descriptive things that you need for that babysitter to do well first of all you tell the babysitter i've already fed the children they can have a snack at 8 30 the snacks are in the fridge there's some fruit already cut up it's put in this blue container but after snack time they can have no other snacks do not give them any sugar there's a list of numbers on the refrigerator there's some emergency contact numbers here's the number here's my number here's where i'm gonna be at if you need me you call me and you keep ranting and the list goes on and on and on and on until the babysitter finally says I got this. Go ahead and go. We will be all right. Well, Jesus is doing the same thing here. He is giving his disciples some last-minute instructions just before he is going to be crucified. And as you probably recognize, the term one another is mentioned throughout these two verses. And if you guys recognize, you probably know that one another is a term that's mentioned throughout the Bible. And every time we hear one another, the reason that there are these one another passages is because these passages are to reflect love. Because love is the one distinguishing mark of being a follower of Jesus Christ. It is the distinguishing mark that shows that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ because Jesus identifies love for one another as the telltale sign that we are his people. I like what Josh Hunt says. Josh Hunt says that ministry is not top down, but rather ministry is one another. The world that we live in teaches us that we need to strive to reach the top. It tells us that we need to claw our way to get up the corporate ladder. It says that the leadership position is the best place to be. That control, pride, money, and esteem are all related to your position on the social and economic ladder. But Jesus tells us quite the contrary. His display of how we live to live our life is shown to us by the washing of his disciples' feet. He is, going, he is here to show us a greater way. He is here to show us 
his way. Because remember, he tells us that the first will be last and the last will be first. And Jesus' example is what he wants to share with these disciples, who in turn he wants his disciples to share with those follow, with the followers that they're going to lead to Jesus Christ. Because from this we're going to get our church as we know it. And Jesus wants his church to live in this manner. He wants his body of believers, he wants the local church to strive to be the chief servant. And all of your faces just went long. Because this commandment was not anything new, okay? The disciples didn't have the New Testament. They couldn't open it to John chapter 13 because the New Testament is being lived out as we speak what we're reading right now. They had copies of the Old Testament. They knew that in Deuteronomy that God has commanded them to love him. They knew that in Leviticus they were commanded to love one another. But what Jesus is saying is that his command regarding love was being presented as a new standard because they quite did not get it. He was modeling to them sacrificial love. He said, as I have loved you. So what makes this new? Well, what makes it new is that we are called to love one another just as Jesus has loved us. He shows us how to love one another just as God had intended it from the beginning of time. When we serve one another, we serve one another voluntarily. We serve one another out of love for one another. When a person loves another, service is involved. And when we have others' intentions on the forefront of our minds, in the forefront of our hearts, we have others' best interests in mind. And that's what Jesus wants us to do. That's what Jesus wants us to learn from his examples. Because the love that Jesus has given us is an unconditional love. It is love based on commitment rather than feelings or emotions. Working with teenagers is rewarding work. I love it. Don't get me wrong. But one of the things working with teenagers that you hear all the time is you hear the little group of guys or the little group of girls talking, and they'll say, oh, I'm in love. Oh, I'm in love. Oh, I'm in love. And one of the things that we constantly remind our kids is when they see an attractive young lady walking by or an attractive young man walking by, and they get these feelings in their stomach, and they, they're a little ooey and gooey and stuff going on inside, I go, guys, that's not love. That's gas. <laughs> The kind of love that Jesus is displaying for us is not a reciprocal love that seeks out what can I get from others in return. Unconditional love is a love based on a commitment to another person. I love what C.S. Lewis writes about love in mere Christianity. He says this, Do not waste your time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the greatest secrets. When you are behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love him. If you injure someone you dislike, you will find yourself disliking him more. If you do him good in turn, you will find yourself disliking him less. Jesus reminds us, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Before I came into full-time ministry, I worked as a public relations director for a home health and rehabilitation company. And one of the guys that I worked with, one of the speech pathologists, was a real neat guy. I enjoyed talking to him. He had a real nice heart. And he was always up and down regarding emotions. There would be times where he'd come in on Monday morning gloating because he got to spend time with his kids. He had just recently gone through a divorce, and he, you could tell that he loved his kids because when he'd come to work on Monday after a weekend spending, spent with his kids, he would talk about the places they went, the, the games that they played, the, the places they ate, and all the different things that they did. But then his frown would go upside down, and he'd become sour because he said, then I had to give them to my ex-wife, and of course, not a lot of nice words came out after that. And he asked me, Joe, what is it that you do that you're in such a good mood all the time. Even on Mondays, you come in and you're bouncing around saying good morning and you're smiling and just things around you look so great all the time. I said, you know what? What I do every morning before I get out of bed is I thank God 
for the day he is about to give me. And I ask God to give me an opportunity to be a blessing to someone that day. Loving one another is how people will know whether or not you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. And you guys are probably thinking right there, okay, Joe, you need to take a time out and tell me what a disciple is. We've heard this word disciple being used all morning long. Over the last several weeks, of course, we heard the term disciple because we just came out of Resurrection Sunday services where we glorified and, and, and talked about the resurrection. And, of course, all the weeks leading into the resurrection is talk about Jesus Christ, Palm Sunday, and his disciples around him and the Last Supper. Well, a disciple, as defined by freedictionary.com, is as follows. A personal follower of Jesus during his life, especially one of the 12 disciples. Or it is a follower student of a teacher, leader, or a philosopher. So if we are followers of Jesus Christ, then therefore we are disciples of Jesus Christ. And what we need to begin to do today and moving forward is we need to become more comfortable in our skin. We recently began a new study on Wednesday nights with our teenagers about becoming disciple makers because after all, that is what we are all called to do. We are all called to be disciple makers. So you're probably asking, how do I begin to live a life of being a disciple maker? Or how do I live a life of disciple making? Well, we need to be intentional about how we live our lives. And we also have to live on mission. We need to live by two things that Jesus shared with us. He shared with us the great commandment and he shared with us the great commission. The great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, with all that you are. Second one is just like the first, love your neighbor as yourself. And of course, the Great Commission, go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them all things that I have taught you. Just that simple, guys. And over the last several years, and probably over the last thousand years, there has always been a test of a true follower of Jesus Christ. And these tests probably change over the years, they change from culture to culture, and they probably even change from church to church. But the passage that we read this morning is clear about how we know what a true believer of Jesus Christ is. And we know that by the love that they share for one another, because that's what Jesus says. If we truly love God, we can do what we please because we truly love Him and our desire would be to be doing his will. But Jesus didn't stop with the greatest commandment. He said that the second commandment was just like the first one. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he followed that by saying all of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And that everything else that God wants us to do will flow out of these two commandments is to love God and love our neighbors. And I don't know if you guys are just like me, but every time I read this and I come across this, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, with all that you are. Love your neighbor as yourself. And I think, well, why couldn't he have just stopped with the first greatest commandment? Because the first greatest commandment, loving God, is pretty easy. You know, we can love God because we walk out our door, we smell the air, you know, we look, hear the birds, you play with our puppies, we get to see all the great creation. Of course, we get to see all the great people that are around us. But then again, he doesn't have to live next to the person that I live next to. Do I have to really love that guy? I don't know what he was thinking when he said, love your neighbor. But regardless of how lovable your neighbor is, we are all called to love our neighbors. And Jesus insists that these two commands are inseparable, loving God and loving our neighbor. In 1 John chapter 4, we read this. If someone says, I love God but hates a Christian brother or sister, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? We all come to church on Sunday. Some of us have better attendance records than others. But we all come together on Sunday morning. Some of us on Wednesday nights for Bible study and other times in between for other different gatherings that we have. We all profess our love for the Lord. We all say amen. We all shout hallelujah. We all stand. We sing. We read the word of God together. We raise our hands sometimes. But in the back of our mind we're thinking... I can't stand that person that sits in that third pew over there. Jesus said that the whole world will know that you are disciples or my disciples by the love that we share for one another. 
love one another just as I have loved you. And by saying those comments about the people that live around us, we need to be very, very careful because God may just make them our roommates in heaven. When we become God's children, when we profess love for Jesus Christ and begin to follow him and are adopted into his family, we need to then display a family resemblance. The sign that we have truly received God's love into our lives is that it's going to flow out of our lives and into the lives of others. Because Jesus' people, Jesus' followers, his disciples are identified by the love that they share for one another. And you guys are probably sitting there thinking, okay, Joe, we already know this. We've heard this countless times. But hearing and doing are two different things. Hearing and doing are two different things. It's okay to hear something. It's okay to read something. But are we doing it? Because in the Old Testament, the standard was love your neighbor the same way that you love yourself. But here, Jesus one-ups that love. Several years ago, we did a church-wide study on the Ten Commandments. And in the teenage department, we talked about how... God wrote the Ten Commandments on the stone tablets, gave them to Moses, gave, Moses showed them to the world. But then when Jesus came to this earth, Jesus reiterated these commandments, but he also one-upped them. He said that if you hate your brethren, you've committed murder in your heart. He said that if you lust after a woman, you have lust in your heart. So he one-upped them. And the same thing is happening here. He's one-upping the Annie. He's saying... Don't only love your neighbor, but love them as I have loved you. The command of love is old, but the standard and the level of which he's now telling us is a new commandment for the disciples and for us as well. And how has Jesus loved us? If we're going to love others like Jesus loved us, we need to know how he has loved us and we learned that just a few weeks ago as we celebrated the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Recently, I was reading a story online. I know my wife probably thinks I play games online, but I actually do some reading and research online. And, and uh, I, I read this one story that, was, that, that really brought a tear to my eye. It was a story about a little boy and his sister. And his sister had a disease that was curable only by a blood transfusion by someone who had been able to overcome that same disease. Well, it just so happened that her younger brother had just overcome that same disease a few years ago. So the doctor sat the little boy down and he said, listen, we need to give your blood to your sister because without it, she's going to die. And the little boy just sat there quietly. And he decided that he was going to go ahead and proceed with the procedure. Well, a few days later, they wheel both brother and sister into the hospital, and they take the little girl into another one room, and they take the little boy into another room. And the nurse comes in, sticks the needle in his arm, and the blood begins to flow out. And the little boy begins to cry. And the doctor comes in, and he says, what's wrong? The little boy asks, so when am I going to die? The little boy thought that by giving up his blood, he was going to die because he didn't know that his body would replace it. But that's the kind of love that we need to display for one another. That regardless of what we have, if we have something that can save someone else's life, we need to be willing to give it up because that is what Jesus did for us. Jesus' love is a sacrificial love. It's not a kind of love that looks out for number one. It's not a kind of love that, what have you done for me lately kind of love. It's a kind of love that we are going to give up because someone else needs it. Another characteristic of Jesus' love is that we serve one another. Another story that I read online was a story about this rabbi. This rabbi lived in this small community, and every Friday morning he would get up and leave. And the people in that community would say, well, our rabbi goes up to talk to God. That's what he goes and does. Well, there was this new guy that moved into the community, and 
he was kind of skeptical about that story. So he gets up early one Friday morning to follow the rabbi, to spy on the rabbi. He noticed that the rabbi got up early in the morning to pray. And then the rabbi would put on some old clothes, go to his woodshed, take out an axe, and walk into the woods. He would go and chop down wood, and then he'd walk two miles down into the forest to a house where a single mom lived with a handicapped child. He would leave the wood and would come back home. He would leave enough wood for the week for the family. So now that he knew the rabbi's secret, every time that the topic of the rabbi's Friday morning adventures came up, people would say, of course, the rabbi goes to talk to God. And the stranger, the new guy to the town, underneath his breath would say, if not, higher. Jesus said, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life for, as a ransom for many. All of us today this morning would say that we love our husbands, that we love our wife, that we love our kids, but have we served them lately? We all say that we love God, but have we served his people? Because love is shown through humble service, not through something that requires us to be applauded for or something that needs to be given back, but just like the rabbi, loving and serving the need quietly and even anonymously. If you're going to serve like Jesus served, if you are going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, and people are going to say that person carries the distinctive mark of being a disciple of Jesus Christ, I challenge you this week to open up your doors or maybe even go see someone that you haven't spoken to for a while that you know has a need. Too many times we don't do it because we feel that that person's need is contagious, that whatever person that person is struggling with is going to rub off on us. But God has placed many an opportunity for us to serve one another, to love one another, to minister to one another. So this week, before we leave here this morning, I know each and every one of us has someone that we could be a blessing to this week. So don't just think it. Take out a piece of paper and a pencil. Grab one of the offering envelopes that's in front of you and write that person's name down. Put it in your Bible. Put it in your purse. Put it in your pocket. And this week, be intentional about loving that person in whatever capacity that that person needs to be served because that is a Jesus kind of love. Because Jesus' command to love one another just as he loved us does sound overwhelming, but it can be done when we become intentional about how we live our lives and how we love one another just as Jesus has loved us. At this time, I'm going to ask Pastor Ray and the band to come up and sing a song of invitation. And as he comes and sings a song of invitation, I'm going to ask that you do some serious business of your own. When was the last time someone said, that person has that distinctive mark of a disciple of Jesus Christ? I know for a fact that that person is a follower of Jesus Christ. If we 